loving us and, uh, and caring for us and meeting our needs. Thank you for the wonderful plan of salvation you established before the foundation of the world and a redeemer to carry out that plan. Thank you for the good day we've had together as a church family. Thank you for Brother Fogel and, and Sally and their ministry. Thank you for their faithfulness. We trust that you will minister to them and help them as they travel and carry out their ministry. And as he ministers tonight, we ask that you might uh, hold him in your hand and give him what to say. And we'll be, thank you. we'll be careful to thank you, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I do ask that you probably to keep uh, Pastor Burns in your prayer. He was a little lost this morning. Can't come in that side anymore. And I think he was wandering around over here, not knowing that this side of the church was even over here. So if you see him wandering around over there, just point him towards his car so he can get back to going. Or just, or just tell his wife. She'll find him and drag him over where he needs to be. All right, one more song before it's time for our pastor's pals. We'll sing number 66 in the chorus book, Give Him the Glory. Pastors, pals, you can come on up. All right, there's a lot of you. Come on up, guys. How's everybody doing? Good? All right, who remembers what we talked about last week? All right, Bradley. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What about them specifically? Anybody else know? Bradley's got it down. All right, Hannah. Good. They wouldn't bow to the statue, so they put them in the fiery furnace. And what happened to them? Did they burn to death? What happened to them? Right. God was with them and he protected them because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego chose God over man. Tonight, we're going to a little different type of story about a few men in the Bible. All right. We're going to talk about fishing. All right. Because I love to fish. How many of you guys like to fish? All right. A lot of you like to fish. What about hunt? Hunting season is coming how many of you want to hunt? I know Max hunts. Does anybody else hunt? You hunt too? All right, so two of you hunt. How many of you want to hunt when it, when it gets time? Okay, a lot of you guys want to hunt. Hunting's a lot of fun, but tonight we're going to look at um, a, a couple men in the Bible who were fishers. 
Um, they fished um, in the Sea of Galilee a lot, and the four fishermen, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, had never seen so many fish. This is talking about the story when Jesus told them to cast their nets on the other side of the boat. How many of you know that story? Anybody? What happened? They weren't catching any fish. Jesus said, hey, cast your net on the other side, and what happened? They got a ton that they Yeah, they got hundreds of fish. Their nets were full. So this is right after that. They had never seen so many fish. The flopping fish filled the boat, standing knee-deep in fish. Peter stopped and bowed before Jesus. Peter knew he was a sinner and that Jesus had done amazing miracle for him. He said, Lord, please leave me. I do not deserve your kindness. I am a sinner. But Jesus was not going to leave Peter and his friends. No, instead, he asked them to join his group of followers. Jesus loved them so much that he wanted them to spend every day with him. He said, all your life you've been catching fish, but I will turn you into fishers of men. Come be my disciples. When they reached the shore, Peter, Andrew, James, and John immediately left their nets and boats. They, wanted, uh, they, weren't, they weren't just leaving their fishing equipment. They were leaving the whole family business. Jesus had called them to be his disciples. From then on, they would live with Jesus and travel wherever he went. They would learn his teachings and help him serve others. These disciples had seen Jesus easily fill their boat with hundreds of fish. Now they knew he could also fill God's kingdom with many Many people using even simple sinners like them. All right, here's the tough question. How many of you, how many of us are sinners? Yep, all of us are. But you know what? God still wants to use you guys to bring people to know Christ as their Savior. All right, so this week, be looking for opportunities to share Christ with your friends. All right? You guys help me take an offering? All right. Thank you, Pastors Pals. I know you miss Pastor Derek. I do too. And hopefully he'll be back soon so that he can do Pastors Pals with you guys once more. But I've enjoyed my time with you guys. I really have. Um, so thanks for putting up with me. Um, but you guys will get Pastor Derek back here soon. And I'm looking forward to that as well. We are encouraged and privileged to have Dr. Larry Fogel with us uh, this week. And we um, welcome him back again this evening, and we look forward to what God is working on his heart to share with us this evening. So we have a video that we're going to watch, and then it's, you can come on up back. Baptist Bid Missions has just celebrated its 100th anniversary. We want to thank your church for the part that you have played in partnering with us in fulfilling the Great Commission. In 1920, our founders set forth a vision that was twofold. First, they wanted to reach the millions of souls for whom Christ died, still waiting to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Secondly, it was their burden to awaken the churches of the United States in regards to their responsibility to take the gospel to the world. I'm thankful today that churches like yours have partnered with us, churches that have embraced their responsibility to fulfill the Great Commission. 
churches that have sent out and supported a missionary force that through the years has numbered into the thousands. A missionary force that God has used to see tens of thousands of souls saved and thousands of churches established. Missionary-led Bible schools and seminaries have trained pastors and Christian leaders to carry on the ministry, and our Bible Translation Society has provided God's Word to those who had never read the Bible in their own language. So we say thank you. Thank you for being an integral part of this ministry. Rejoice with us for what has been accomplished to God's glory. By anyone's standard, 2020 has been an unusual year. The pandemic has affected ministry worldwide. And like you, our missionary family has adapted and risen to the challenges of ministry during COVID-19. Let me share a few of the highlights. In the jungles of Peru, the quarantine provided new ministry opportunities. From his rooftop each night, one of our missionaries led neighbors in singing Peru's national anthem and saluting the police and military. Then on Sundays, he preached from the rooftop through a loudspeaker. Their closest neighbors, Ander and Beitsabe, Listen through a crack in the wall. Each decided to trust Christ as their Savior, and others listened and received the Lord as well. Local high school officials in South Africa contacted our missionaries about providing food for students, some of whose parents had lost their jobs because of shutdowns. The team printed gospel cards and cooked and boxed 85 meals in three weeks. They also set up an online chat so those students could reach out for help in dealing with depression and stress due to the lockdowns. In Holland, our missionaries were forced to postpone April baptisms. They were rescheduled in June and July, held outside, and split into two separate events complying with mandated group sizes, but still allowing these believers to give testimony and to obey the Lord. In a creative access nation, our missionaries dedicated a church building addition enabling them to seat 1,000 people. They also celebrated their 1,099th baptism and dedicated the 15th Daughter Church, which was started through the outreach of the church's own missionaries. A 16th Daughter Church is currently under construction. In Cambodia, the church held their annual Bible conferences during the Buddhist holidays to provide believers with an alternative obligation to participate in so they could excuse themselves when pressured by family to take part in ancestor worship. Instead, they studied the living word and praised the living creator together. Because of a rise in COVID-19 cases and because the church's air conditioning wasn't working, the staff at a downtown Cleveland, Ohio ministry canceled their August vacation Bible school. In its place, one missionary took to the road with a VBS on God's creation. Bringing a decorated wagon, crafts, snacks, and mats for the kids, she taught two different groups of kids in front of their homes. A total of 40 children attended and learned about the power of God and the magnificence of his creation. In Peru, as the pressure of strict quarantine regulations found many without funds for basic necessities, our missionaries handed out food and essential supplies. Altogether, 100 people have made professions of faith in Christ, and over 30 of those continue in Bible studies to this day. This is just a small sampling of what God has done through the gospel in 2020. And the great thing is this, your church has had a part in reaching those people for Christ. You are the ones who have prayed. You are the ones who have given. You are the ones who have sent the missionaries to reach people for Christ. And so we're thankful for the part that you have played in that. Those missionaries have sown the seeds, they've watered, and God has given the increase. We thank God for what he has done, but we also want to thank you for the vital role that you have played in spreading the gospel of Christ across the globe. BMM enjoys a wonderful partnership with churches like yours in taking the gospel to a world that needs Christ. And along those lines, I want to make a couple of comments about your support for Baptist Midmissions missionaries. I told you this morning that your total lifetime giving from your church to support BMM missionaries and ministries totaled over $180,000. So one of the reasons for our coming is to say a special thank you to you. But I want to commend you for a couple of things. 
Uh, you have increased your missionaries support. We personally have benefited from a couple of increases in the last couple of years. And I want to say thank you to you from us personally for your support. In addition, I want to thank you on behalf of the mission for considering the needs of your missionaries and responding as God makes it possible for you to do so. I also want to comment on the fact that you have been commendable in the way that you have responded to meet the needs of a young missionary lady going out from your own church. Somebody who grew up in your church, somebody that your church has sent out of your own membership. I have access to the Baptist Admissions donor database as stewardship representative. And I have seen in addition to the $300 a month that you're currently giving to Ruth Coleman, I see numerous other gifts throughout each year since she headed to the mission field. And you have responded again and again and again, individuals sometimes giving through the church, but giving over and over and over again to support your own member missionary. That is phenomenal. And I want to say thank you. We recognize that you're trying to care for your own member missionary. And that, above any of the rest of us missionaries, is your responsibility. Thank you for being serious about that. I want to have you turn just for a moment to Psalm chapter 96. We're going to spend just a few minutes in the Word of God here, but then I'm going to go to a couple of different things. I have a story to tell you about Chad Africa, and then I want to tell the story with pictures of one of our teaching trips to Chad, Africa. So follow along with me in Psalm 96, verses 1 through 5. O oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Sing unto the Lord, bless his name. Show forth his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the nations are idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Again and again in the scriptures, creation is used as an example of one thing that proves that God himself, our Lord God, presented in the scriptures to us, is the one true God. Now, what is the role of a missionary? What is the primary thing that a missionary is responsible to do? You will all very quickly come up with the answer, and that is, of course, to share the good news about Jesus Christ, which brings salvation and eternal life. Uh, I want to suggest to you, however, that while that is the primary activity that a missionary should be involved in, there is another ultimate goal, something beyond sharing the gospel. What would you suppose that would be? These verses might point you in the right direction. We share the good news about Jesus so that people can come to know and worship and give glory to the true God. That is our ultimate purpose as missionaries. So I think if we are to be focused only on the human need of people for forgiveness of sin and the assurance of heaven, we are perhaps a bit short-sighted. In fact, that might lead us to the conclusion that missionaries are performing a man-centered ministry only thinking about human beings and their need for salvation. 
There is an ultimate goal for missionaries to, to seek to reach, and that is a God-centered goal of bringing people to know the true God so that they can worship him, exalt his name, praise him as the one true God. Now, it is mentioned here in these verses that uh, in the end of verse 2, we are to show forth his salvation from day to day. Well, of course, we cannot ignore the, this uh, matter of uh, bringing salvation to people through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But look at the emphasis in these verses. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Oh, all the earth, all the earth, sing unto the Lord. Sing unto the Lord, bless his name. I go down to verse 3. Declare his glory among the heathen, his wonders among all people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared among all gods, above all. For all the gods of the nations are idols. But who is it who made the heavens? It's the Lord. So I want to suggest to you that we have a God-centered purpose as missionaries. Certainly, sharing the gospel is an important part of that. But ultimately, we want people to know him as we know him, so that they will honor him. They will worship him as we do. A story from Chad, Africa. Some of you may remember that I was born in Chad, Africa. My parents were missionaries there. Uh, they were among the earlier of Baptist Mid-Missions missionaries, although not in the first pioneer parties of missionaries who went. From 1937, they were in Chad, Africa, and later, after 30 years there, transitioned to the country of Central African Republic next door. Why did they make that transition? That was at a time when in the early 1970s, they had a president who wanted to return their country to its roots and therefore, he was trying to eliminate everything that he believed to have come in from outside the country, every foreign influence, including Christianity. That man who became the president and eventually led to the martyrdom of 13 of our Baptist Midmissions affiliated pastors and one of our Bible school students had been a Sunday school teacher of adults in our largest Baptist Midmissions church in the country of Chad. Only after he got into politics and climbed the ladder to become the president of the country did he show his true colors. He appointed a minister of religion who wanted to insist that everybody, including Christian parents, had to send their children to an initiation out in the jungles where they would be forced to worship evil spirits There were many Christians, of course, at that time who refused. And the pastors led the way. They tried to give courage to their people to stand against the government mandate. There were evil things that happened out there in the woods. And those young people were all introduced to all kinds of evil. Well, it didn't take long before this president, like President, like uh, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, began to call people in. He arrested this group of 13 pastors. And one Bible school student 
who used to be in government employ, and he did not like what he was seeing in the government, and he felt that God was calling him into the ministry, so he left government service to go to Bible school to train to do the very thing that his president was saying you should not do. And so now he was targeted by the president as well. And President Tombalabai put these 14 men in prison. The day came when he called them before him, just like King Nebuchadnezzar asked Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to come before him. Is it true that you have refused to honor my mandate? That you're trying to counter my efforts to get rid of Christianity and instead to return our people to the old tribal religions? Well, sir, an old man, Pastor Berdita, a pastor that I remember from my childhood, living there on the same mission station where that largest church was located. Pastor Berdita spoke up for the other pastors. And he said, to use the words of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. We know that we are to honor you and obey you in all things, except when you tell us to do something that is against God's command. He said, I'm going to give you one chance here today. If you're willing to renounce the name of the Lord Jesus and promise never to preach again in the name of the Lord, then I'm going to release you and you can go home to your wife and your children. They all looked at each other. And Pastor Berdita again spoke up. He said, you have asked us to do something that we cannot do. Tomorrow you will all be loaded into a truck and you'll be taken outside the limits of the city of Sar and you will be executed. They were herded back to their prison cells. The next morning came, along with a number of soldiers armed with their rifles. They were put in the back of a big truck and they were taken about 12 kilometers outside of town to what is now sugarcane fields. They were led over to the edge of a pit that had been dug by a bulldozer. And with their backs to the pit, they saw the soldiers line up opposite them each pastor and Bible school student with a soldier opposite him with his rifle trained on him. Again, they were given one more opportunity to renounce the name of Christ. Again, all the pastors looked to Pastor Berdita. He spoke up and said, I'm sorry, even if we must lose our lives, we are not able to renounce his name. The one who has saved us. The one who has promised us eternal life in heaven with God. But Pastor Berdita went on. He said, before you shoot us, will you allow us a moment to gather together to pray to our God? Okay, they were given permission. They gathered together, they prayed together. Now they took their place again in the line, backed up to that pit. Pastor Berdita spoke up again, and he said to the leader of the soldiers, Thank you, sir. You know the custom of our people. If we are going to a far place and... We know that we're going to be staying in that place for a long time, obligating somebody to provide hospitality for us. 
We must send word ahead to let them know that we are coming. We must not arrive and surprise them that we have come to stay here for some days and we're going to be eating your food. So we have just now talked to our God. We have sent word to him that we are coming and we're going to be staying with him. Now you may do whatever you have to do. And they prepared for the gunshots. As they were waiting, the pastors began to sing a song. And the best that I can identify this song that they started to sing in the Sango language, it was, My Jesus, I love thee. Do you remember the words of that chorus? At the end of the chorus, it says, let me see if I can remember it. If ever I loved thee, Lord, it is now. It's now. Even if you allow this to happen, even if you allow them to shoot us, to end our lives on this earth, we cannot stop loving you. If ever we loved you, it's now. And that's the story of the martyrdom of those 13 pastors and that one Bible school student who were unwilling to renounce the name of the Lord Jesus. Now I want to take you through a number of pictures quickly to tell this story of a teaching trip back in 2018. It always takes just a moment for this to warm up after I turn it on. Well, I did use it from up here this morning. Do you have it on the screen there with the black slide? Okay. I don't remember this morning that I had to point it in any particular direction. All right. Say what? I, I didn't hear, I'm sorry. I guess we're going to have to do that. Go ahead, Ed, and I will, it, it will go just one uh, animation at a time, but yes. Go ahead, please. All right, Chad, January 2018. Go ahead, just keep moving at every few seconds here. Two module courses for the pastors and leaders of a church association. Both of these courses to be taught concurrently, side by side, but everybody in the classes to be in both classes. Three hours a day for one class, three hours a day for the other class. For two weeks, 30 class hours on these two classes. Romans and Theology 2. Dave Mumford is somebody who will come and join us toward the end of the first week. It was his first time teaching for us as a potential adjunct for us. He was a missionary in France, had left his mission to join Baptist mid-missions. That never happened, but he is a, a full-fledged adjunct for us now. Excellent French. Dave and I used French. Scott had to be translated because the only language he can use is English. Uh, so here you see the number of hours that each of us taught. 28 hours for me. And that These numbers are including the Sunday services where we each preached in area churches. Scott, 27 hours. And Dave, 
17 hours because he came in later in the week from France. Go ahead. Praise God for about 85 decisions. We referred to the numerous decisions uh, this morning in the Sunday school hour from each one of our conferences. Where is Chad Africa? It's that uh, country showing a little bit in green there. It's uh, upright. And uh, to its north is Libya, to the south is Central African Republic. Go ahead. Now, when we used to go to Chad in the past, we would go to teach in their school of theology. And there we had to give tests and homework and grades. So we would leave the grades with the administration. It was part of their required coursework. This is the School of Theology in Balimba, just outside the town of Sar. Sar is one of the larger towns in the south. It's the town where I was born, actually. And uh, this is that class. These are pictures from past times when I was there teaching. And a lot of time spent just talking with the pastors and a few of the wives who were also in the same classes. And of course, the obligatory picture with uh, all the professors and all of the students in the class. Go ahead. But in January of 2018, we weren't going to teach in that school of theology. We had just begun the previous year what we call our certificate program, a cycle of 12 courses that would be taught, two courses each trip for six trips Two trips a year, so it would take three years to get them through all 12 courses and graduate them with a certificate. This was not intended to be in conflict or in competition with the School of Theology. In fact, the School of Theology sponsored this certificate program. It's an auxiliary program to give further training to people who have already been through their schools and Right from the beginning of this program, the leaders of the School of Theology said, we want our students, every time you come for one of these courses, we want them to be in on that. And we will give them a test after you leave. And we're going to consider these courses in our curriculum. Oh, hey, wow, I got it moving here. Oh, we're good now. Thank you. Now, usually we fly south about two and a half hours in a missionary aviation fellowship plane, but it wasn't available this time for when we needed it. And so we had a 16-hour road trip. Thankfully, there was a missionary. Oh, I need your help again. I apologize. There was a missionary who brought her car down, a single lady missionary, she picked up these three men. She had her chauffeur with her uh, driving on these roads and with some of the things you have to face on the roads uh, for a single lady to travel by herself is just not wise. But I want you to see this paved road that we traveled. Now, you can see a few holes ahead. We're uh, uh, traveling with one set of wheels off in the dirt on the side, and there's a good reason for that. The holes are worse here, and here's another section of road that is worse yet. It was pitifully slow travel, and 16 hours in one day is not a fun way to travel on these kind of roads. Well, we came to a certain place in the road, and right near a village, we saw some animals crossing in front of us. What in the world? As we got closer, we realized please, that these are camels. There's a whole troop of camels, domesticated, of course, and there's somebody riding on the lead camel there. We came and interrupted them. A few of them were on one side of the road, and others were still coming from the other side. This is dry season. So there's no green anywhere except on the established trees. There's a herd of cattle right off the side of the road. You can see there are just uh, 
stunted trees here and there. We're in the southern part of the Sahara Desert, just as it's transitioning to savanna grasslands. Now, these are the kind of huts that you might see. These are uh, sunburned bricks, clay bricks, mud bricks. And they're plastered together, cemented together with mud. And then just a simple framework of saplings on the roof, and to those saplings are tied sheaves of grass or straw. We come into another town, and this is an Arab town, and uh, people selling stuff by the side of the road. It was noon, it was time to eat, we were all hungry, we had left early in the morning. And so we stopped and we scoured these booths for something to eat. Well, here was the first thing our eyes lit on, and these are fried grasshoppers. Uh, we passed these by, and we found a, a roasted chicken, and they cut it up into pieces for us, and we, we uh, headed on our way. We continue, we're coming toward the intersection for Kutu, where at the town of Kutu, we will take another road back over through our hospital town, Kumra, to arrive in Sar. But here we have a traffic jam, my goodness. We haven't seen traffic like this since we left Jamena, the capital. We're starting to see more trees, and especially when you see a lot of fruit trees, you know that you're coming to civilization. So these are mango trees, and there will be other kinds of fruit trees here too, because they've all been planted. These are not naturally grown. And so they've been planted. We know we're coming into a settlement of some kind. We arrive in Kutu, where the team mission has a print shop. We had arranged ahead of time with them to print all of our class manuals so that we could have those to distribute to all of the attendees in our classes. So we stopped there. We had to pick up the boxes of uh, class manuals that had been previously printed. They were waiting for us. We paid the bill and we had to load up. Now, think of this. We've already got five adults in the front two sets of seats. We have all of our luggage in the back and on the top, and now we have to also make room for cartons of these class manuals. Each class manual, like an American Bible College syllabus, 75 to 125 pages in length, all translated originally uh, now into French, ready to pass out to the French-speaking students who will come. And after we load up, we head on uh, down the road until we're coming now into the town of Sar, just before the sun is going to go down. We arrive finally in Sar, and we stay in the home of BMM missionaries, Les and Carol Carew. They happen to have a guest wing on the house that they're renting, and they use that guest wing over and over and over again for PEP teachers, for Bibles International, Bible Translation Consultants, etc., etc. They offer a ton of hospitality to guests who come into the country for ministry. Well, we had time on uh, Saturday afternoon and evening to uh, work on email, connect to the uh, intermittent internet, and to be able to think ahead and prepare ourselves for our preaching assignments on Sunday this is Dr. Scott Williquet, who was there with me as one of our partners to teach the course on Theology 2, Systematic Theology 2. Saturday morning, oh yes, it was Friday that we traveled because we needed to get there by, by Friday evening. Saturday morning, I wanted to be able to attend the last few hours of nearly a week-long church association conference for our 500 plus Baptist Midmissions affiliated churches across the southern part of Chad. And so I just stepped in quietly, sat near the back. Somebody noticed me, they called me up in front to introduce me and to have me pray. And 
Uh, Les and Carol had just recently returned from furlough, so they wanted to introduce them to all of the church uh, uh, representatives. Saturday afternoon, Les and Carol Carew have an English club. This is an outreach for them to young people in the area. And because Les still struggles with French or with any national language, uh, he uses an African man as his translator who knows English quite well. And he handles himself very well. But they have this English-speaking ministry to young people in the area, and kids are just flocking to it in greater and greater numbers. They have a big room in a payot, in a, a shelter, a hangar that is now enclosed just outside of their house across their driveway. And we meet there, and whenever they have a guest, they like to bring that guest in to speak English to these people, sharing their testimony, for example. And then they asked me if I would share a couple of real life stories, uh, wild animal stories from Central African Republic, and do it all in English, but speaking as clearly and distinctly as I could for the sake of all of these African young people. They're there to learn English after all. And then afterwards, I will ask them some questions. And hopefully they have picked up some bits of information along the way, and somebody will stand up and give the answer to that question in English, just based on the story that I have told. Wonderful outreach, because most of these young people are Muslim. And they come because it allows them to learn English, it allows them to be together with other young people in a safe setting, and just a ton of fun. They're all very open, polite. Oh, sometimes they'll argue something that we tell them from the scriptures. But always in a polite way. And there are decisions for Christ being made in this English club. So here I'm telling those, one of those stories. Well, Sunday morning, each of us, uh, Scott and I, we ended up being asked to go to different churches and preach. And just to give you an idea of this church, we start with a French service where I had to preach directly in French. And then we would take a break. And then we would have a Sango speaking service. Now, here is something that I've always struggled with in Africa. For them, leadership means power. And every leader in the church wants to be seated up there in front of everybody, where everybody can see them. We have talked and talked and talked about this. And this is something very cultural that we just struggle to get past. There are deacons up there. Sometimes there are deaconesses sitting up there. The choir is seated up there directly facing people, and they will stay there through the whole service. And then you see the secretary of the church. He'll be sharing the announcements, probably 15 minutes worth. And he sits right up there on the edge of the platform. It bothers me. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Now, this is the offering time, and uh, everybody comes up from their seats, and they make a parade up front, and they all put something in the offering. Choir sings. Oh, by the way, you've seen, uh, go back one. Do you see all the decorations in the church? This was in January 2018, not long after Christmas. They worked hard to put up all those decorations. Why take them down when they're so pretty? Now, I'm not being critical. I'm saying this is just important to them. And then after church, we all got together, the pastor and the deacons, and uh, we just had a time of fellowship, and they brought sodas for us, and I forget whether there was a snack of some kind, too. Now, starting on Monday was the PEP teaching conference hosted by the French Baptist Church. This is the same building that used to belong to the 
the uh, SAR, the, the big, this was that big mission church that Pastor Berdita was the pastor of. I used to live on this property in an old mission house, which is no longer. Now, we're in one wing of this church. I want you to notice that on the other opposite side is another wing. Now, we'll go back again. Go back one. Yeah. Uh, here we are in this wing. The platform is right up there. And then on the other side of the platform is another wing. And then down this side, there is another wing. And there, so it's a three, three sides to this church. It's like a T with the platform in the middle of the top of the T. And this was done on purpose. My father helped to build the first building on this site. And they did this on purpose because they were dealing with people of different tribes and they all needed to be translated in the beginning from Sango. And if you were going to give each of them a turn, the service would have taken forever. A half hour message would have ended up two hours long. And that's because every language group had to have his language translated for them to maximize their ability to understand the message. And so instead, by building it this way in a T, three different wings, each wing, the people of each language group would know which wing they are to sit in, and they would have their translator, and all three translators will be translating to their people at the same time without bothering each other too much. So we've started our classes on Monday morning. Just, just move through these, maybe two seconds on each one. Just, just move through them now. And I'll just keep up with you here. We don't have time to spend much time. We took time to read verses, and we had people uh, participating by standing and reading a verse for us. They're all following along on their copy of the notes. Go a little bit faster. There you go. We had a few women there, as I said this morning. Scott Williquid is up in front now teaching. He had to be translated. Gédion has given himself to teach, to translate for any English-speaking teachers every time we go. So he's been a real blessing to this program. Now, there are a few people sitting in one of the other wings I guess so they don't have to sit so far back in that one wing. Everybody following along, making notes, filling in the blanks. And now we're dismissed for lunch and siesta, normally from noon until 2 o'clock. It's lunch and siesta time. And so you see the ladies from several churches in the area are by turns coming uh, each day, a different group of churches sends somebody to help the women to prepare the meal. And all the cooking is done outside like that. And then a group of five or six men will gather around one set of dishes. And everybody having washed their hands, they all just reach into the pot and bring it to their mouths and then go back for more. Uh, you don't like double dipping, I know, but you, you wouldn't get along well here. This is manioc paste instead of rice and a meat sauce. Uh, there will either be a meat sauce every day or some greens, some kind of a vegetable, leafy vegetables that, that are edible. They know which leaves are edible. I have a couple of favorite leaves and some others that to me taste a little more bitter. For us, they often serve pasta, uh, potatoes with, with uh, roasted chicken or sometimes we had uh, even some vegetables, uh, even salads that have been carefully prepared. I'm going back again. You see with onions and carrots and uh, tomatoes. And uh, I really love the vegetables. After lunch, while most people are taking their siestas, I often was asked to, to sit with a pastor and he would talk to me about problems he's facing in the churches. I would give some counsel to him. 
And then you look at what the other men are doing during nap time on those wooden benches. Well, that was more comfortable than this would be, I would think. Bathrooms. Sorry, got to talk about it. There are five booths here. Pit latrines. They reserve for us normally the middle one because if we were the only ones using it, we would be more likely to find it clean when we stepped in there. We had to bring our own toilet paper. Sorry, that's what you got to work with. So you want to use the toilet at the mission house before you come in the morning, or you're hoping you can wait until you get back to the mission house in the afternoon. Back to class. Everybody taking notes. All right, we're not going to be able to continue here long. What is happening there? I guess I touched the button wrong here. Now, I want to end here by telling you that we have graduated in the fall of 2019 140 people from this certificate program, having taken all 12 courses. About half of them were pastors. For them, it was some review and some brand new courses that they had never studied before. For the lay leaders, for almost every one of them, it was the first formal training they've ever received in Bible or Christian ministry. And they all sit there eagerly, paying attention, wanting to take advantage of this learning. In fact, we're in a second cycle right now of teaching through those same 12 courses to other people who heard about the courses the first time through but couldn't come. And so we were just finishing the first cycle when we were told by the association leaders, we have at least 100 people more who want to get in on a second cycle. Our two teachers got there in January to start the first teaching of that second cycle, and they found 165 people there. Now, We've had to cancel the last two teaching sessions because of COVID. Just now in October, we're sending our two guys again to do the next two courses. And I just asked the leaders, how many should we print for? They said, count on 175 this time. Praise the Lord. We have 500 plus churches across the South that are affiliated with Baptist Midmissions. Independent, but affiliated. And we are helping to bring some real change and a fresh energy to those 500 plus churches through this teaching. I have to stop. I'm already over time here. Thank you for your attention. Uh, we'll be here for a few minutes afterwards to answer questions. Uh, please approach us. We'd love to answer your questions. That's one of the reasons why we're here. God bless you, Pastor, if you will close in the way that you see fit. Thank you, Dr. Fogel. Um, we are going to close in prayer. Um, sorry. And then um, I'm going to have you guys go back to your table. Um, and I'll turn some more lights on in here. I hope no one fell asleep because the lights were off. Um, but no. Um, thank you. Did see, a couple. Did see a couple. All right. You're going to have to get with me after so we can give a list to Pastor Derek. So no. <laughs> but uh, we're going to close in prayer. Um, thank you guys uh, for coming this evening. Thank you to the Fogel family. Again, thank you guys. And be safe tomorrow traveling. Um, but let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for the Fogel family and their ministry, Lord. I pray that you would continue to bless them uh, for their faithfulness um, as they journey through this. And we thank you for uh, the good report we heard. Um, it is a joy and a blessing to hear a good report, and um, it's good to um, know more of what they're doing as well. And so I pray as they have more graduates that they're looking um, at, and as they have uh, more of a ministry coming um, in different areas, I pray that you would continue to work through them as they grow, 
as they, the ministry even gets bigger, Lord. And I pray that we can do our part to support them through prayer um, and any other necessary uh, means, Lord, that you have gifted us to be able to do that. I pray that you give them safety on the road tomorrow um, and also be with um, the, the health issue as well, Lord. I pray that they would get in um, and that you would allow them to um, be, get that opportunity um, tomorrow, Lord. And we do thank you for them. And we thank you for your love for us. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Satan seems to whisper, there is nothing but a grave. I call out to my Jesus for a vision of his face. And then my Savior lifts my eyes to behold his saving grace. In Christ I stand forgiven, in Christ I stand. Redeemed. 